Jeremiah 7, 23 and 24, and then chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. But this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. And then a complaint that God has when he says they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. This is, we read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord teach us to be sober when we attempt to advance the gospel. When there's so many who, who identify themselves as being in our camp who, who have so many confusing messages about the gospel. Thank you. Please be seated. We want to watch now the, uh, the video, the Bible uh, project video of Jeremiah. The book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decades of the kingdom of southern Judah. He was called as a prophet to warn Israel about the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through their idolatry and injustice, and he even predicted that the empire of Babylon would come as God's servant to bring this judgment on Israel by destroying Jerusalem taking the people into exile. And sadly, his words became reality. Jeremiah lived through the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and witnessed the exile personally. Now, this book came into existence in a really interesting way. Chapter 36 tells us that after 20 years of Jeremiah's preaching in Jerusalem, God called him to collect all of his sermons and poems and essays and commit them to writing, which Jeremiah did by employing a scribe named Baruch, who wrote down and compiled all of this material into a scroll. Now, Baruch also gathered lots of stories about Jeremiah, and he linked all the pieces together. And so this is why the book reads like an anthology, a collection of collections. It's all been arranged to present this prophet as a messenger of God's justice and grace. So the book begins with God calling Jeremiah to be a prophet, and he's given a dual vocation. He will be a prophet to Israel, but also to the nations. And his words will both uproot and tear down, but also plant and build up. In other words, he's going to accuse Israel and warn them of God's coming judgment, but he also has a message of hope for the future. Now, this opening perfectly summarizes the first large section, chapters 1 to 24. It's a collection of Jeremiah's writings from before the exile. And the core idea here is that Israel has broken the covenant with God and violated all the terms of the agreement they made that are written in the Torah. And in a number of ways, they've adopted the worship of all kinds of Canaanite gods, building idol shrines all over the land. And Jeremiah develops the metaphor of idolatry as adultery and uses the language of prostitution, promiscuity, unfaithfulness to describe how Israel has given their allegiance to other gods. Jeremiah also repeatedly accuses Israel's leaders. The priests, the kings, the other prophets have all become corrupt. They've abandoned the Torah and the covenant, which has led to a tragic result, rampant social injustice. The most vulnerable people in Israelite communities, the widows, the orphans, the immigrants, were all being taken advantage of in clear violation of the laws of the Torah. And Israel's leaders didn't even seem to care. So a classic place where all of these ideas come together is in chapter Chapter 7, it's called Jeremiah's Temple Sermon. The Israelites are coming to worship their God in the temple as if everything is just fine, but outside the temple they are worshiping other gods, and some were even adopting the horrifying Canaanite practice of child sacrifice. And so Jeremiah makes his very unpopular announcement. The God of Israel is coming in judgment. He's going to destroy his own temple and punish Israel by sending an enemy from the north. This is an army that God would allow to conquer Jerusalem, and as you read on, you discover he's talking about the great empire of Babylon. And so this all leads up to a transition in chapter 25. 
Israel hasn't turned back to their God, and so in the first year of Babylon's new king, Nebuchadnezzar, God tells Jeremiah to announce that the Babylonian armies are headed for Israel and all of its neighbors to conquer them and take them into exile for 70 years. He compares Babylon to a cup of wine filled to the brim with God's just anger at all of Israel's injustice and idolatry, and God will make Israel and the nations drink from this cup. Now this chapter is key to the book's design because everything that follows is going to focus on Babylon's coming attack. First on Israel in chapters 26 to 45 and then on the other nations in chapters 46 to 51. The section about Israel first contains stories about how Jeremiah begged Israel to turn back, how he warned them right up to the last minute, but the leaders of Israel kept rejecting him. The section concludes with a large collection of stories about how Jerusalem was under siege and eventually destroyed by Babylon and about how Jeremiah was persecuted all through that time and eventually kidnapped and taken against his will to Egypt by a group of Israelite rebels. Now, right here in the middle, in between all of these dark stories of disaster and judgment, is a collection of Jeremiah's messages of hope for Israel's future. So he picks up on Moses' prediction that after Israel had broken the covenant and gone into exile, see Deuteronomy 30, God would not abandon his people. Rather, he would renew his covenant with them and transform their hearts. Jeremiah develops this promise and he says that God is going to one day inscribe the laws of the Torah, not on tablets, but rather on the hearts of his own people. He's going to heal their rebellion so that they can truly one day love and follow him fully. And so one day, Israel will return back to the land, and the Messiah from the line of David is going to come, and that's when all nations will come to recognize Israel's God as the true God. So these chapters are showing that despite Israel's apostasy, God is not going to let Israel's sin get the final word. Rather, his own faithfulness will bring about the fulfillment of his promises no matter what. After this, we find the large collection of poems about how God is going to use Babylon to judge the nations around Israel. So Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Edom, Ammon, Damascus, Hazor. But then, surprisingly, the longest poems are saved for last, and they're about God's coming judgment on Babylon itself. So although God used this nation to execute his justice, God doesn't endorse their violence and idolatry. And so Babylon too will come under the standard of God's justice. And so Jeremiah denounces this nation's pride and injustice as well. Now, Babylon is larger than life in these poems. And it reminds us of the image of Babylon all the way back from Genesis chapter 11. Babylon has become the archetypal rebellious nation. In their glorification of wealth and war, God's going to give this nation over over to its own destruction. The book concludes with a story taken from the end of the book of 2 Kings. It tells about Babylon's final attack on Jerusalem, how they destroyed the city walls and burned the temple and took the people into exile. The story shows how Jeremiah's warnings of judgment from chapters 1 through 24 were fulfilled. But then the chapter ends with a short story about the captive Israelite king Jehoiakim. He's heir to the line of David. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and shows him favor and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life. And that's how the book ends. So it's a little glimmer of hope. And this recalls Jeremiah's promises of hope from chapters 30 to 33. God hasn't abandoned his people or the promise of a future coming king from David's line. And so while this book contains a huge amount of warning and judgment, the final words conclude with a note of hope for the future. And that's what the book of Jeremiah is all about. Let's, uh, let's jump right in. Jeremiah is an autobiography of one of Judah's greatest prophets during the, the nation's darkest days. Apostasy, idolatry, perverted worship, moral decay, uh, these were all conditions under which Jeremiah lived and ministered. What someone called an avalanche of judgment is coming, and Jeremiah is called to proclaim that message faithfully for 40 years. And in response to his sermons, the tender prophet gave, uh, the tender prophet of God experiences intense sorrows at the hands of his countrymen. He faces opposition, beatings, isolation, and imprisonment. 
Even though he's rejected, though, and persecuted by his own countrymen, Jeremiah lives to see many of his prophecies come true. Babylonian army does arrive, as he prophesied. Vengeance falls upon the people. And God's holiness and justice are vindicated. In all of this, Jeremiah is not gloating uh, that he was right, but his heart's broken uh, over all that falls upon the people. If you're looking for a time frame for this ministry, you're thinking about 627 A.D. to 580 A.D. You'll recognize that 586 is the, is the Babylonian captivity. And if you want to just get a sketch of, a, of the flow of the book, because it's really kind of hard, it's hard to piece it together chronologically. It's hard to piece it together thematically. It's, uh, it's basically, as, as, as was described in the video, 20 years into his ministry, God tells him, write down your sermons. And so he gets Baruch to help him do that, and he's, he's reflecting back and looking forward. But if you want to get something of a flow, it would be something like this. Let's see. I believe it. So you have the section before the fall of Jerusalem. You have that, Michelle? In that time, you've got the call of Jeremiah, which begins in chapter 1, 1 through 1, uh, 19. I want you to look at verse uh, 10, chapter 1, verse 10 with me. This is, this is his call. This has been recognized through the years. As, as how God calls a reformer. Behold, I put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you, set you this day over the nation and over kingdoms to do what? To pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, and to build and to plant. Six agenda items God gives him. Four of these have to do with, with reforming. And then out of that uh, coming something of a renewal. Uh, in his call. His prophecies to Judah uh, take place beginning in chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to chapter, chapter 45, verse 5, where in, that, in the course of that he condemns Judah for its conduct, it's turning its back on God, and then that causes conflicts uh, with him and with the people. And then, uh, then there's the restoration, uh, future restoration, the promise of that that we'll look at a little more a little later. So before the fall of Jerusalem, then you have the fall of Jerusalem, uh, chapters 34 to 1 to 45, 5, prophesying about that. And then you have after the fall of Jerusalem. Of course, it's during this time that there are prophesies, prophecies to the Gentiles, uh, condemnation of these nine nations that were listed on the, on the video, and then the actual fall of Jerusalem uh, and the historic conclusion, which is, was taken from Second Kings. When you survey uh, the book. He's, he's called, he was called as a prophet during the reign of Josiah. Josiah, if you remember, was the last of Judah's good kings. Uh, and even with all the, the Reformation-minded uh, advances that Josiah made, uh, they could not hold back the apostasy of the people that had just reached such a, pe a feverish pitch. So the downhill slide of the nation continues unchecked, all the reforms, attempted reforms uh, notwithstanding. And there are four uh, godless kings who, who follow uh, Josiah and who reign during Jeremiah's ministry. The people continue to pursue apostasy, idolatry, and so much so that this is what is said by God through Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 3.11. Remember now, <clears throat> Israel has been taken captive by Assyria in 722. Listen, what, and the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. That's the comparison that's made, that Judah goes so far down the path that that it makes Israel look righteous by comparison. They give themselves over to, to spiritual and moral decay. Uh, they refuse to repent or even listen to God's prophet. And so, as one writer said that I read, said radical surgery was required for the nation. 
He warns, Jeremiah does, of the coming judgment. Uh, Babylon will be God's instrument of judgment. Babylon, either by name or the, or the nation to the north, is mentioned 164 times in Jeremiah. More than all the rest of the books in the Bible put together. 164 times. He preaches faithfully about the rebellion of Judah and the condemnation that will come. And he does this for 40 years. As I said earlier, he doesn't do it, though, with, with spite or with any glee, any smugness. He's very sympathetic, and he grieves, and he weeps. He often wanted to resign uh, from his office because of the content of his message and the, and the reception or non-reception on the part of the people. And so if you want to look at a couple of verses that kind of get his heart as the weeping prophet, lonely, rejected, and persecuted. Look at Jeremiah 9, 1, where he says, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And then Jeremiah 13, 17 says, But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. If you, uh, we take the chronology that we gave there, I think that's the best way to attack it. So I'm going to go into that a little more. His, the call of Jeremiah in chapter 1, uh, he was called and sanctified before birth to be God's prophet. When he said, uh, Look at chapter 1, verse 5, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Um, before I formed you in the womb, this, you, you get a sense of, of John the Baptist here, set apart from his mother's womb to take the message. And even though, like Moses, he, he felt very inadequate and not up to the task, the Lord said, no, I've, I've called you. That, and that makes you adequate <laughs> because I'm the one that's going to send you. So you have this, this call of Jeremiah. Um, then there's these prophecies to Judah. He communicates the message of God through, through a variety of parables and sermons and object lessons. Uh, so his life, God tells him to do some things. And we're going to look at Ezekiel in the near future. And God has Ezekiel do some really strange things to catch the attention of the people to give them the message of the Lord. Well, well uh, Josiah's uh, challenges from God are not as, not as exotic as Ezekiel's, but they're object lessons nonetheless. And so there's these 12 graphic messages that Jeremiah gives. He, he lists the causes of Judah's coming judgment. There's um, the Gentile nations, here's one of the charges God makes. The Gentile nations are more faithful to their false gods than Judah is to the true and living God. Uh, they're identified as a false vine because they follow idols and they don't have any excuse. They, they've seen the hand of God. They know the teachings of God. The people are condemned for an empty profession. In other words, it's just, it's just lip service. It's not a heart commitment. And they're for the disobedience to God's covenant. And for this spiritual harlotry, as the video pointed out, that, that idolatry uh, equals spiritual adultery. One of, the, one of the pictures is that God has bound himself to Judah, or bound Judah to himself, but Judah has become like a rotten waistband, corrupt and useless. Jeremiah even confesses on behalf of the people to God, uh, but the Lord responds that their sin is too great. So he weeps. 
One of the signs of the, of the imminent judgment is that he's forbidden to marry and participate uh, in feasts. We'll look at that, that passage shortly. And because the people do not uh, trust God or keep the Sabbath as he's ordained it, God says the land will receive a Sabbath rest from them when they're taken into captivity. One of the teachings, messages that Jerusalem will be invaded and the rulers and people will be deported to Babylon. The restoration will only come under the new shepherd, the Messiah, the nation's future king. Jeremiah announces by God's uh, revelation that this captivity will last 70 years. While there are false prophets on the scene at the time, insisting it will not happen at all. And so the Lord says to Jeremiah in chapter 2, verse 25, keep your feet from going unshod and your throat from thirst. But you said it's hopeless, for I've loved foreigners, and after them I will go. And so he's, God is speaking through the prophet uh, to him and then to the people. Jeremiah suffers a lot of, of misery and opposition because of the message that he brings, as you can imagine. All the prophets and all the priests reject him, some even calling for his death. But through all of this, these warnings in chapters 30 to 33, there is this assurance of a restoration and hope for them under a new covenant. A remnant will be delivered, and there'll be a time of blessing coming to them. In chapters 34 to 45, it's Jeremiah's personal experiences and his suffering are the focal point of that, uh, as the opposition against him mounts and increases. At this point, he's no longer allowed in the temple to preach, so he sends his assistant Baruch to read his prophetic warnings. Jehoiakim, the king, takes his scroll that Baruch has been uh, becoming the amanuensis for, writing down, and burns it and throws Jeremiah in prison. And after the city is destroyed, uh, Jeremiah is taken to Egypt by Jews who are fleeing, and he prophesies that Nebuchadnezzar will invade Egypt as well. In chapters 46 to 51, there's these prophecies to the Gentiles um, against the nine nations of Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, which is Syria, Arabia, Elam, and Babylon. And in, that, in those prophecies, only Egypt, Moab, and Ammon, and Elam are given a promise of restoration. And then in chapter 52, the fall of Jerusalem, uh, Having, having warned for 40 years the doom, uh, Jeremiah's message is finally vindicated. Uh, and it's, it's an event, one writer said this, he said, so significant that it's recorded in detail four times in the scriptures, in 2, Second Kings 25, Second Chronicles 36, Jeremiah 39, and Jeremiah 52. Jerusalem's captured, destroyed, plundered. The leaders are killed or taken captive uh, to Babylon. As far as the, the book itself and the title, the, it's a prophecy of a man divinely called in his youth uh, from the priest city of Anathoth. One fellow described him as a heartbroken prophet with a heartbreaking message. The name of the book, uh, if we could see it, Yeremiah who, or Yeremiah, literally means Yahweh throws. Perhaps meaning Yahweh establishes, appoints, or sins. The Greek form of this is Hieramias, and the Latin is Jeremias. So the author is just Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priest. And he lived uh, 
about two miles north of Jerusalem in Anathoth. He was not allowed, as I said earlier, to marry. Look at Jeremiah 16, 2. And this, the picture behind this is there's no need to marry. The land you're living in doesn't have a future. You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. His life was one of continual conflict. Even in his own hometown, he was threatened. He was tried for his life by the priests and prophets of Jerusalem, put in stocks, forced to flee from King Jehoiakim, publicly humiliated by the false prophet Hananiah, and thrown into a cistern, a big, a big water uh, container. He is, its, he is its author, Jeremiah 1.1. 1, 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. He dictated his prophecy, as the video referenced, to his secretary, Baruch. And after this scroll was destroyed by the king, Jeremiah dictated a more complete addition to Baruch. You can find that in chapters 36 to 38. And then later sections were also composed. The people who study textual criticism say that only chapter 52 was evidently not written by Jeremiah. This supplement is almost identical to 2 Kings 24. 18 to 2530, and people suggest that it may have been added by Baruch. Daniel alludes to Jeremiah's prophecy of the 70-year captivity. Jeremiah's authorship is also uh, asserted in non-biblical documents like Ecclesiasticus, uh, Josephus, and the Talmud. But the New Testament makes explicit and implicit references to Jeremiah's prophecy. I want to, we'll look at those for a few minutes here. Look at Matthew 2, 17 to 18, which is, which is referencing Jeremiah 31, 15. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Then Matthew 21, 13, which is a reference to Jeremiah 7, 11. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And then the same thing in Mark 11, 17. He was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And, and then in... Uh, Luke 19, 4, he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. Now look at uh, Romans eleven twenty seven. 27. This, this is a reference to Jeremiah 31, uh, 33, on this new covenant. This will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And, and Romans eleven twenty seven 27 cites that. Then Hebrews 8, 8 to 13 is, is also a reference to this Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, which is the New Covenant language. When the Hebrew writer says, For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That's the, the covenant on Mount Sinai. For they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward them, toward their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, this is the Hebrew writer he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so you have several places in the New Testament that are referencing uh, Isaiah, I mean, pardon me, Jeremiah, and uh, just affirming and strengthening up the, the, the assertion of, of his authorship and the genuineness of this prophecy. It'd be interesting to, for you to know concerning the date and setting that Jeremiah was a contemporary of Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Daniel and Ezekiel. His ministry stretched, as we've already said, from 627 to about 580 B.C. 
Uh, Josiah was the king. Remember, it was during the reign of Josiah that uh, these reforms took place when the book of the law was discovered in 622 B.C. Uh, Jeremiah was on good terms with Josiah, and he grieved when, uh, when he was killed in 609 B.C. by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. Uh, by this time, though, Babylon had already overthrown Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. Jehoahaz replaced Josiah as king of, of Judah, but was only king for three months before he was deposed and taken to Egypt by Necho. Then Jehoiakim was Judah's next king, but he reigned sort of as an Egyptian uh, vassal until 605 B.C. when Egypt was defeated by Babylon at Carchemish. So you, it's important for us to understand, and we, we should, you know this, of course, that what's happening in Judah or in Israel is not happening in a, in a bubble. It's very much influenced what's happening on the world scene. You've got these, these nations clashing. And Babylon, is, at this point, is rising to ascendancy as the, as the greatest uh, nation on the earth, even greater than Egypt, which was hard to believe. Nebuchadnezzar took Palestine and deported key people like Daniel to Babylon. Uh, Judah's king, Jehoiakim, was, was now a Babylonian vassal, but he rejected Jeremiah's warnings in 601 B.C. and rebelled against Babylon. Jehoiakim, or Chin, then became Judah's next king in 597, but was replaced by Zedekiah three months later when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and deported Jehoiachin to Babylon. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, and his attempted alliance with Egypt led to Nebuchadnezzar's occupation and overthrow of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So, so you get kind of a, a sense of the flow of history uh, happening around. And these kings were all, uh, after Josiah, they were all uh, evil kings. You can, you can identify three stages in Jeremiah's ministry. The first is from 627 to 605. He prophesied while Judah was threatened by Assyria and Egypt. Then there's the second stage, 605 to 586 B.C. He proclaims God's judgment while Judah was threatened and besieged by Babylon. And then from 586 to about 580, he ministered in Jerusalem and Egypt after Judah's downfall, after the Babylonian captivity was underway. The theme and, and, and purpose of uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah portrays God as patient and holy. He says to the people that he has delayed judgment and appealed to his people to repent before it's too late. There's an object lesson uh, where Jeremiah is sent down to the potter's house. It's a picture of a ruined vessel could be repaired while it's still wet, but once it dries, it's too late. Look at Jeremiah 18, 1 to 4. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into a another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. So there's this picture of a, of a, a vessel being, being created on the potter's wheel. It goes bad, something else. So, but he's able to take the wet clay and remake it. But look at Jeremiah 19, 10, and 11. The picture here is that when, when this vessel has dried, it hardened, then it's, it's only good for the uh, for the trash heap if it's not a useful vessel. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and shall say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, so will I break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel so that it can never be mended. Men shall bury in Tophet because there will be no place else to bury. It's a very uh, powerful picture, the warning of just how uh, thoroughly devastating the destruction will be. So God's warning in this is that Judah's time for repentance will soon pass. And because they defied God's words and refused to repent, the Babylonian captivity was inevitable. Jeremiah lists, of course, as we talked about the moral and spiritual causes for their coming catastrophe, but he also proclaimed God's gracious promise of hope and restoration. 
there will always be a remnant and God will establish a new covenant. It's one of the, one of the themes that runs through the Bible, that God always has a people. No matter how dark it may get, no matter how many may turn away, no matter how many he may judge, he always has a people. So what are some keys to understanding Jeremiah? Where there's the key word is that this Judah's last hour, the time is running out. We need to take that and apply that in, in a gospel way. God is merciful, but he extends his, his mercy. There is a day coming for those you and I know who are shown overtures of the gospel to repent and believe, but the day is coming when, when it will be beyond that day. There will not be another opportunity, not another call to repent, not another occasion. It's, uh, it's the last hour. The verses we've already read, we're going to look at those real quickly. In verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 23 to 24, this, I command, this command I gave them, obey my voice, I will be your God. You should be my people. This is covenant language, remember. If you, I will. Well, these were typical suzerain type treaties. Obey my voice, I will be your God. You shall be my people. Walk in the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. There's, there's this, this picture of blessing tied to obeying the word, the voice of God. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. So rather than hearing the word of the Lord, taking him seriously, they went their own way, uh, didn't take heed to it, and they, they lost ground. They did not advance forward as a nation. And then Jeremiah 8, 11, and 12. They've healed the wound of my people lightly. Some about the prophets, contemporary prophets with, with Jeremiah, the false prophets. Peace, peace, it, all is well. God's not going to judge us. God's not like that. You know, if you listen to that, and I'm, and I'm gonna call a name here. It reminds me so much of Joel Osteen. He's not the only one, he just sort of is the archetype of this. It's always sugar and spice and everything nice. And you know, when, you, when he's confronted and pressed about, no, he doesn't preach about sin and, and doesn't really emphasize Jesus is the only way because gee, I have a bunch of Muslims who attend certain, it's, they, they, they treat, heal the wound of my people lightly saying peace, peace when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not even know how to blush. That's a picture of a, uh, of a society or of a culture that's lost any shamefacedness. Things that uh, years ago, decades ago, would have been unmentionable are now uh, spoken aloud in public, in, in circles, mixed circles. With no sense that God is offended dismissing God's clear teaching from his word, mocking the gospel. In fact, changing the gospel so much that it's barely recognizable as gospel. It's not good news. It's just false information. It says, no, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen. And when I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. In other words, there's a devastation coming. There's a price to be paid, whether it's the nation of Judah, whether it's, the, whether it's evangelicalism in the West, there's a price to be paid when we are not sounding a clear sound, when we begin to tamper with the gospel, when we think we can take it and, and, and clean it up and make it more palatable, make it more acceptable. God takes high offense at that. And that's what you're looking at in Judah. The false prophets were doing that. Then the key chapter and the whole book is chapter 31. Because chapter 31 it, it has these wonderful promises. And we're going to spend a few minutes looking at this. Even though Judah has broken the covenants of her great king, God has promised to make a new covenant. Now, when we went through the study of the covenants years ago, I told you that this was always there. Uh, and you see it in Genesis, in the, what we call the proto-evangel, the, the gospel in its in its prototypical form where, where Adam and Eve are expecting nothing but death when God comes into the garden after they'd sinned against him. He pronounces judgment. There are implications for what they've done. But then there's this note of promise. 
The seed of the serpent will strike the heel of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Now we, we listen to that and that's kind of language that doesn't really, we don't just that make us feel warm and fuzzy. But Adam and Eve heard it for what it was. In fact, she wasn't even called Eve then. They heard it for what it was. Because Adam named his wife Eve as a result of that promise of God. He said, she shall be mother of all the living. And that's, the, the tone there is we have a future. We're not going to be destroyed this day. The proto-gospel. So it's been there all along, different forms and the different covenants, and we looked at that. And so this, there's this, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And before we look at that a little more, I want to remind you, and we, we recognize this once a month here on Sunday mornings, that Jesus instituted that new covenant with his death and resurrection. Look at Matthew 26, 26 to 29. Now, as they were eating in the upper room, Jesus took bread, after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink, uh, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This new covenant coming. Jesus instituted it with his life, death, burial, and resurrection. So let's, what about seeing Jesus in Jeremiah? Well, He's all through it. His, as I said at the outset, Jesus' heart, his temperament for people. It's, Jeremiah has that. He weeps over the people, just as Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Even though he brings a message that is very severe to the religious people and to the folks who are following the apostasy of the religious leaders. But in chapter 23, verses 1 to 8, He's depicted as the coming shepherd. So I want us to look at, at that here. Chapter 23, 1 to 8. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Remember, they, they heal the wound, of my, the, the wound of my people lightly. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you. For your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them. Now I want you to notice the language. We're going to see this language here in Jeremiah 31. The I wills of God. Recognize that. We told you when we were studying covenants that these, these unilateral declarations of God it's not the typical if then, if you then I, if you then I. This is the I wills, I will, I will. I will set shepherds, verse 4, over them who will care for them. They shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord our righteousness, or as it is uh, in the Hebrew, Jehovah said canoe. Jehovah said canoe. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them. In other words, there's a day coming in the new covenant when it will not be about what God did in the ancient past. It'll be what he's done in the, in the contemporary setting. Then they shall dwell in their own land. This idea of Jehovah said canoe, the Lord our righteousness, that is, that is the essence. We just looked at this recently going through the five solas. 
sola, uh, <laughs> sola fide, justification by faith alone. This, this was what gripped uh, Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith. He is, he is our righteousness. It's not only that we, as Jesus said, need to be perfect if we're going to, our, our righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. But we need his righteousness, an alien righteousness. And this was, this, this gospel theme is in the book of Jeremiah, the Lord, our righteousness. His life will stand for us. His death will be in our place. His resurrection will seal our relationship with God. And so this, this picture that he will, he will raise up this, this one from David, from David's lineage. So you have this, this powerful picture. And that, that brings us to look at the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. And I want you to notice we, we read in this in chapter 23, this, Behold, the days are coming. Behold, the days are coming. This is, a, this is a great promise of hope. Behold, the days are coming, verse 31, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Now watch the I wills, unilateral. God's promised it, very much like he promised Abraham. I will put my law within them, not on tablets of stone, external, but in them. That doesn't nullify the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. The rest of the Mosaic covenant is nullified, but the tablets on stone, of course, continue over. But what happens is when he puts his law in us, then John says in 1 John 5 that the commandments are not a burden when you have a new heart. You have the spirit of Jesus who said in Isaiah, I delight, I come and I do your will as it's written. Your law is in my heart. It's the, it's the spirit of Paul in Romans 7, I delight after the law of God in my inmost being. That's, the, that's one of the transformations that comes when you are a recipient of the new covenant. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. Think about the picture. You know what the picture is here. This is the God who with his finger wrote the Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. Remember, we, we went through this when we went through Exodus. The only part of the Mosaic law, Mosaic covenant that we're told was written by God of the Ten Commandments. Everything else Moses took down as God dictated it to him. And I'll remind you when we looked at that then, my, it was my friend Errol Hultz who went home to be with the Lord earlier this year. We were talking years ago and he said, he said, Bill, the catechism teaches what the scripture says that God is a spirit and does not have a body like man. How can it be said that God writes on the the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. He said there's only one place where God has fingers, and that's in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. He says the Ten Commandments, I believe, were written by the finger of the Son of God, who comes several times in the Old Testament as a theophany, the face of God taking on human form. So He writes not on tablets merely, now He writes it on our hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. It's not an if, perhaps, a maybe, certainty. I will be the God to everyone on whose heart, in regeneration, a new birth, I write my law. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. This is what you have to realize is happening here in the prophecy. This is what happens in the new covenant. He says in, in, uh, in Ezekiel, I'll take out the heart of stone, replace it with the heart of flesh. I'll write my law on their hearts. And then he's talking about the ultimate manifestation of this. You know, when, when, the, when the new covenant has come upon the heart of everyone for whom it was intended in regeneration, 
and we are ushered into the presence of God there, in heaven, there will be no need to teach anyone there saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember their sin no more. Think about the context of this. This comes in the midst of these, these incredible, devastating warnings and pictures of judgment, total judgment, total destruction of the queen city, carried off into captivity for 70 years. And in the midst of this comes these, this great promise, the new covenant, which, as I mentioned earlier, fulfills God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and from your kindred, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. Now notice again the I wills, these I wills, I wills. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then in Genesis 17, a little farther, as this, if you're familiar with Genesis and the covenant manifestation, every time God pronounces it, he opens it up a little more, a little more. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, may multiply you greatly. Abram fell on his face. God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This, you, could, you can find this in Jeremiah uh, chapters 28 to 30 about Moses, the promises to Moses. Uh, second, pardon me, not, not Jeremiah, Deuteronomy 28 to 30. And then of David, 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 17. This, this building of the promises of God comes to its fruition in Jesus, but is prophesied by Jeremiah, who is bringing the people. Um, in the picture I gave you back when we studied the covenants, I want you to remember this. It's like standing in a cave, a dark cave. If you've ever been in one of these, you know what I'm talking about. You can't see anything. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And someone strikes a match. The, the light of the match has the effect of pushing back darkness. It's you see some things. If that match is touched to several other matches or to a candle or to a torch, the more that this light is expanded, the more you're able to see. And no one would, would rationally think when they see more things that the fact that they have more light means that things have been brought into the cave that weren't there before. They were all there. And the more light you have to, to shed on the matter, the more clearly you see. That is the way God unfolds his covenant ministrations from Genesis all the way uh, into the end of the Old Testament. <coughs> and then there was this, this curse on Jehoiachin. Uh, it meant that no physical descendant would succeed him to the throne, this, this, this particular descendant of David. Look at Jeremiah 22, 28. And 30. Is this man Kaniah? That's he was he was called variously Jehoiachin, Jeconiah, or Kaniah. Is this man Kaniah a despised broken pot, a vessel no one cares for? Why are he and his children hurled and cast into a land they do not know? O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. The Davidic covenant promised that there would always be 
a son of David to sit on the throne. And Jesus is that ultimate son of David. But what about his contribution to the Bible? What, in the scheme of, the, I think you see in Jeremiah that, uh, that the, uh, the picture of Jesus as the shepherd who's coming to restore things. Uh, Jehovah said canoe, the Lord our righteousness will be his name. This promise of the new covenant focused in him. Someone said this, they said, while Isaiah is generationally chronological, Jeremiah is not. So you have, you follow the order of Jeremiah's, of, of Judah's last kings, this is a possible arrangement of the or, oracles. And so they, they would suggest that, uh, that here's, how you, here's how you best see Jeremiah. Josiah, during the reign of Josiah, chapters 1 to 6, the, the reign of Jehoahaz, chapters 22, 10 to 12, Jehoiakim, chapter 7, Chapters 25 and 26, 35 and 36, they just, it's just broken up. Jehoiachin, chapters 22 and 23, then Zedekiah, and then get alive. But the main thing, Jeremiah presents Yahweh as the sovereign creator and Lord of all people and nations. His love is holy and his compassion is righteous. He is the only true God no matter what false gods and idols were brought to bear. He hates idolatry and the immorality it produces. And then Jeremiah teaches us, and it's a good lesson for us today, that loss of reverence for Yahweh leads to moral degradation and dissolution. During the course of Jeremiah's life, these are the changes that took place. I want to give you a, a little graphic here to see what Jeremiah saw in the course of 40 years. He began, remember, he began prophesying in a time of, of reformation, his king friend Josiah. But at the end, Judah was a, was a nation in retrogression. They had slipped mightily. In the beginning, Assyria was the world power, dominant power on the scene. At the end, Babylon was the dominant power. It began with, with the Jews in their land. It ended with the Jews being deported to Babylon. Began with Jeremiah prophesying in Jerusalem. It ends with him prophesying in Egypt. It began with him preaching to great numbers of people, the masses. It ends with him addressing a remnant. It began with someone sitting on the throne of David. Think about this. His ministry ended with no one occupying the throne and the throne itself being destroyed along with everything else in Jerusalem. Jeremiah was a man who saw great change. I said this morning that by many standards today, Jeremiah would be considered a failure. No followers to account for. No one believed his message. And yet, in many ways, his message validated the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God, the certainty of the coming of Jehovah said canoe, and the promise of a new day for all who would turn back to God. So Jeremiah, even though it's in the Old Testament, is a great uh, gospel appeal that we need to hear today because I think we live in a day very much like the day of Jeremiah. I don't pretend, I'm not one of these people, you'll never hear me say that America is the, is the new Israel and there are people that believe that. I don't believe that. I believe that our, that our forefathers, the Puritans, came over with this, with this experiment that they call the, the New England experiment. They wanted to establish uh, a real foothold for vital Christianity here. But they didn't imagine that they were the new Israel. So I'm not suggesting that. But what I am suggesting is that America, in the nations on the earth today, no nation has been singularly blessed by God more than America has. To whom much is given, much is required. God is patient, but he's not complacent. And I think that we live in a, in a country right now that, that has only so much time 
to call the people back to God before we see the blast of his fury upon this nation. I'm not a doomsday prophet because remember, fire always purifies. The church will always come out stronger. But I think we need to take some lessons from Jeremiah. Learn to labor along God's standards. Learn to be pleased to find, find our pleasure in serving Him, obeying Him, declaring His name. Warning people that you cannot mock God forever. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person, a family, a church, a nation sows, there's a harvest coming. Unless we're sowing righteousness, we will reap the bitter harvest of devastation and destruction and judgment. That's, that's what we learn from Jeremiah. In the midst of that warning, we're reminded of the new covenant. We know the Redeemer of the new covenant. We've been given a new heart. And the hardest person you know, if he comes to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, will be given that new heart, that heart that beats for him, that heart that delights after him. And so we preach, we pray, we labor, we love, because books in the Bible like Jeremiah tell us there is a hope. Even in some of the greatest darkness that we face, there is a hope.